Hello to the second part of chapter 91 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. This chapter is titled The Peacock Meets the Rosebud and I'll continue from where I stopped the last time. By this time, their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was a small and dark, but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain, with large whiskers and moustache, however, and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. What shall I say to him first? said he. Why? said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and the watch and seals. You may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babyish to me, though I don't pretend to be a judge. He says, monsieur, said the Guernsey man in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. Upon this the captain started and eagerly desired to know more. What now? said the Guernsey man to stop. Why, since he takes it so easy, tell him that now I have eyed him carefully, I'm quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale ship than a St. Jago monkey. In fact, tell him from me, he's a baboon. He vows and declares, monsieur, that the other whale, the dried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one. In fine, monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish. Instantly, the captain ran forward and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship. What now? said the Guernsey men when the captain had returned to them. Why, let me see. Yes, you may as well tell him now that, that in fact, tell him I, I've diddled him and aside to himself, perhaps somebody else. He says, monsieur, that he's very happy to have been of any service to us. Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties, meaning himself and mate, and concluded by inviting Stop down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. He wants you to take a glass of wine with him, said the interpreter. Thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I've diddled. In fact, tell him I must go. He says, monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking, but that if monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then monsieur had best drop all four boats and pull the ship away from these whales, for it's so calm they won't drift. By this time, Stubb was over the side and, getting into his boat, hailed the Guernsey men to this effect, that having a long tow line in his boat, he would do what he good could to help them by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side. While the Frenchman's boats then were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow line. Presently a breeze sprang up. Stop feigned to cast off from the whale hoisting his boats. The Frenchman soon increased his distance while the peacock slid in between him and Stubb's whale. Whereupon Stubb quickly pulled to the floating body and hailing the peacock to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruits of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat spade, he commenced an excavation in the body a little behind the side fin. 
you would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs, it was like turning up old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time, numberless fowls were diving and ducking and screaming and yelling and fighting around them. Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially as the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly, from out of the heavy heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume, which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into then along with another, without at all blending with it for a time. I have it, I have it, cried Stubb with delight, striking something in the subterranean regions. A purse, a purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savoury withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb. It is of a hue between yellow and ash colour. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained, but more was unavoidably, unavoidably lost in the sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud command to stop to desist and come on board, else the ship would bid them goodbye. So that was chapter 91. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 92, titled... Amber Grizz.